Hello everyone, I'm just waiting for a few more people to come in before we really start. But to any newcomers, I'm Marianne O'Connor and I'm the author of Dressed by Iris and I'm going to have a chat with you tonight about my new book and answer any questions you might have about it. So please ask questions because otherwise it's just me talking to myself, which is not what anybody wants to see. So <laughs> I do do that quite a bit anyway, to be honest, but it would be great if you ask questions. So just a few more seconds and then we'll go. You can actually see the book behind me. It doesn't always look like that. I went to a little bit of trouble for you, to be honest. <laughs> even even talked my husband into some Valentine's flowers over there. <laughs> okay, so yes, please ask questions because it does make it a little bit easier because otherwise I'll just go off on my own tangents. Oh, we've got some people coming through. So hello, Sabine from Victoria, Iverlock, huh. and Sharon Hill and Wendy and Diane. Oh, you're coming in very quickly now, so I'm probably not going to keep up with you. Um, where can you get the book? There's going to be a link. That's a lovely question. Thank you for asking that, Elspeth. <laughs> it's, there's going to be a link that comes up on the screen. So um, hello, Tracy. Where are you all from? Tell me where you're from. How long did it take to write? Oh, look, I've got so much to tell you, Sharon. Country Victoria. I wrote a whole book about Country Victoria, actually, Where Fortune Lies. Jill. There's my sister, Jen. Hello, Jen. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for coming. I'll probably get started. Um, this is a better reading event, and they've allowed me to host myself, which is quite a dangerous undertaking. I'm out there in the wild. I'm loose. Look out. <laughs> I do have a glass of wine that I haven't started yet. I'm trying to be good, but I might sip on it from time to time as we have a chat. Feel free to have one yourself. Um, Iona, love Sisters of Freedom. Thank you so much, Louise, Joanne. Oh, so nice to see you all here. Um, speaking of Sisters of Freedom, you can see that on the screen as well. That was my book that came out last year. And it was a very natural progression for me to write Dress by Iris because um, Sisters of Freedom was all about the suffragettes and very strong women at the turn of the century in Australia. And so Dress by Iris came very naturally for me because I was talking about strong women in the Great Dep Depression. So the next generation, so those women's daughters, really, and sons. So um, oh, Tracy's saying it's a beautiful cup. I know it's such a beautiful cup, isn't it? Hello, everybody. Hello from hello everyone in Sydney. I'm in Sydney, actually. I'm in the northern part of Sydney. I live on the bush um, up in the north. And I've got a river at the end of my road, and sometimes I go down there to write. And Dress by Iris has been written here. It was actually written during lockdown. So it was really interesting writing about the Great Depression in lockdown. And um, it's a work of fiction, but there's just so much truth in this story because it is inspired by my family. So let me tell you about the book for anyone who hasn't read it yet. Who's having a glass of wine? They're my friend. Hello, Joy Bell. <laughs> so Dressed by Iris, it's, um, it's a rags to riches story. And that wasn't hard to um, come up with for me because my family literally really were rags to riches. Um, my grandmother um, and my grandfather lived in a pretty much a shanty, a shack in the country in Mongalo, and he made it himself because what happened was he was an Anzac, so he came back from Gallipoli and everything else he went through, and it was just such an incredibly um, hard time for them, these soldiers. They came home having gone through, we all know what they went through, and what their wives went through and what their families went through, and then the world went into economic decline. So not only did they have to go through all of that, they then had to try and raise families on nothing at all. So I thought, well, what a story to tell when I've been raised by this wonderful, massive Irish Catholic family and I know so much about it through them. I'm the youngest granddaughter on both sides. I have 58 first cousins. I think there's 26, 27 on this side of the family, my mother's side. And, of course, it was just a story waiting to be told. So I invented Iris. It is fiction, 
but there's there's a lot of truth. <laughs> I invented Iris and I named her after my auntie Iris, who was just a beautiful woman. She was so funny and strong. She could be cheerful no matter what. And she grew up the oldest daughter in this family, just like the real Iris. And so I sort of thought, well, what if I'll, I'll, I'll have them in this shanty, I'll have them in this terrible situation. But what I really wanted to do was to show how they made the best of everything. And it was a really important message when you were um, writing this in lockdown because I think like everyone else, you felt pretty hard done by and you thought, oh, you know, the world's coming to an end, what a terrible thing. But when you're actually writing and learning about people going through the Great Depression and reading your own family stories and putting them into the fiction, you realise that we're, we're really very lucky. And I do remember my grandmother saying to me, your generation don't really know what struggle is. And she didn't say it in a mean way. She wouldn't be possible for her. But she did, um, it was a gentle reminder from a grandmother to a granddaughter to really count your blessings. And she always counted her blessings. And Auntie Iris did too. So the whole heart of this story is about the best things in life really are free. And they really are. And these people could make fun out of nothing they could make food out of nothing they could have joy and hope when really you know, most people wouldn't be able to and they're always like that I remember my mum said to me a few weeks ago she's very elderly in a nursing home and I said how would you describe Nana who's the mother in the story her mother and she said happy and I just think that's extraordinary considering they went through the war, the Great Depression, and, and then she sent her own sons to war. So that's that's an incredible generation. And so I really enjoyed writing about them. Lots of things happened um, in the book, in the fiction. So Iris, fictional Iris, um, has a real talent for sewing. And she starts kind of getting a feat with it, even though it's a shanty town and she's only really making pennies. And then her brother gets a job on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which my grandfather really did do. And um, they moved to Sydney, but there's a big catch for her because she's in love with the boy from the wrong side of the tracks. Well, she's really from the wrong side of the tracks. He's a bit better off than her, but he's a Protestant and she's a Catholic and they, they just couldn't be together. So off she goes down to Sydney. Um, she gets a job in a department store as a cleaner and they live in the most cramped, terrible conditions and she's treated terribly. But she makes friends with this real live wire model, Natasha, who really I think she kind of steals the scenes because <laughs> she's, she's the person you want to be, you know. She's outspoken and naughty, but she's also very kind-hearted and she's very good to Iris. And anyway, she manages to get Iris noticed for her designs and clothes and Iris becomes um, a designer dressmaker on the top floor. And then the Protestant boy John comes back into her life. Meanwhile, there's... Um, Oh, SP bookies and underbelly, underworld shenanigans going on and evictions and riots and political things. And that so much happened in the 1930s in Australia that most people don't know about. But I really wanted to have this thread of hope through the whole story so that you're just going for this family. You love this family the way I loved my family so much. So that's... um. That's basically what the story's about. I've got a few questions here. Oh, someone said, um, I'm an essential worker and I couldn't begin to understand what it was like to be in lockdown. I would have been hard looking at the four worlds all the time. Well, Carly, fortunately for me, there's always a fifth wall and it's called a computer screen. <laughs> so I'm very lucky to be a writer. So it's not an essential worker job, but it's certainly a job that I could do all the way through. And it did keep me sane, I have to say. Um, Somebody was saying they're really looking forward to reading it, how hard the war and depression was. Yes, that that's the thing you see. Like my mum um, has very vivid memories of have, having to go to the butcher and ask for the ham bones, the leftover ham bones. Most of the meat had been cut off and she said she felt like she had to beg for food. And it's, it's always stayed with her, you know. She's in her, well into her 80s now. Um, but she really was begging for food. And that very kind butcher, Mr Parsons, who's in the book, um, gave the family ham bones and Nana helped them to survive on that. And she would make up a 
ham and vegetable soup from the vegetables in a garden. So these are the kinds of things. That's what I'm saying, that the hardship was a different hardship. So I remember saying to Nana once, oh, I'm so upset. My washing machine's broken. <laughs> she, and this is a woman that had to wash by hand in the creek, you know, and um, had one of those things they called the coppers. And she had to starch all the shirts with sugar and water um, and iron everything despite that in this tiny little shack, you know, with all these children. So they're, a, they're an extraordinary generation and they're fascinating. But just when you're sort of feeling very sorry for them, you're also realising they're very rich. They used to just, whenever I was around them, I'm so sad that my aunts and uncles are gone now and my grandmother gone because whenever you were around them you were uplifted by them and I really tried to pull all of that into this story so that people could feel that warmth and heart and cheerfulness and kindness and incredible generosity that really did exist in my extraordinary family. Someone just said you don't look old enough um, to <laughs> well not really <laughs> Joy Bell, you're a joy, Joy Bell. Um, in actual fact, I am the youngest um, granddaughter, so I'm 53. And like I said, Dad was 17 when he went to war, so you know it's all relative. Um, and Mum was the second youngest, so it's a long, it's a long way back. But uh, thank you for Joy Bell. You're my favourite person listening tonight. Now, <laughs> oh dear. Somebody's saying, yes, meals were made from offal and we turn our noses up. That's the thing. You didn't have, not like my kids, oh, I don't feel like steak tonight, and, you know. <laughs> they, they just made do. They just made do out of anything really. Um, yeah, and I think it's important to remember it. So um, the the things that they had to do. So what else did they do? Nana actually um, made, or well, actually Dar made, an oven out of a dugout termite ant's nest and that was their oven, and she used to book, um, bake beautiful bread in there. So that went into the book, you know. So lots of real things. They had a dirt floor, and when they moved into a real house, they were thr thrilled to have a real floor. And um, they put newspapers on on the walls and on the on the table because they didn't have tablecloth. And I know Nana always loved tablecloths, and I often think maybe that's why. Um, and it's it's so wonderful to think what they did and how they did it so cheerfully and but there's there's certainly scars and I think some of the Catholic scars really did last a very long time I remember in my lifetime actually um the local boys Catholic school used to really have warfare with the local Protestant boys and by the time I got to school that was gone pretty much but um isn't it amazing to think that that carried over from the old country for so long this sort of um you couldn't marry a boy from from the other religion and and vice versa. So yes, it's it's pretty extraordinary when you think about it. Um, so what have we got? Um, after reading so many stories based on world wars and the depression, I constantly told people, "You don't know how fortunate we are." Start reading, and you'll see. Love your stories, Marianne. I think they resonate because they come from your heart. And that's a lovely thing to say, Debbie. Thank you. They do come from my heart, actually, and I tried very hard to put my family into um, the story. It's, it's almost like I can't not because they um, they are who I know and what I know. You know, when you think about, like, Little Women and, and books like that, that you do write what you know and what you've experienced yourself. And I didn't become an author till I was 45, and I think that if I had never um, been a mother or you know, then I lost my father. The, these things have made it possible for me to write about now, these life experiences. And if I hadn't been the youngest granddaughter of these huge families, I wouldn't know these things about World War One, World War Two, the Great Depression. So it's actually been an incredible honour to, um, to be the age I am in and the position in the family that I am. And I also have to give a very big thank you to my cousins who... I think some of them are on here tonight, but um, Iris's daughters and sons, they've just been really wonderful helping me write this story and finding pictures and anecdotal um, stories and it's just been really wonderful. So 
thank you, especially to Elizabeth and Daphne. <laughs> what else have we got here? When did my family migrate here? Um, fifth generation on one side, fourth generation on the other. I had a great, great, great grandfather who was a stowaway. He's the only English ancestor. The rest are all Irish, except for one Welsh woman. And apparently Iris got her beautiful looks from this woman. She had dark hair and blue eyes like Iris. Um, and yeah, Iris was a real natural beauty. Mum always remarks upon it. You'll see her photos around. Um, they're out there at the moment. They're in the back of the book, actually. There's a photo from the back of the book. Um, but she apparently had the Welsh ancestry. And the other thing about the Welsh ancestry, she was really musical, he or she, I don't even know. Uh, and we had this occasional musical genius in our family. My, um, my cousin's son is actually Matt Corby. I'm going to give that a plug because he's so wonderful. And uh, there's a bit of a, a family um, belief that perhaps he got that through this Welsh ancestor. So that's, that's what we say in my family. I don't know if his family is saying that, but we're claiming that. <laughs> it's our side of the family. <laughs> That might not be true. My own son sits there and plays the piano and, you know, just that lovely sort of, you know, hereditary thing sometimes, I think. Hmm. The covers of my book, oh, aren't I lucky? Look at them. Don't you just want that hat and Sisters of Freedom? Though I think I'd look rather ridiculous walking around Sydney wearing that. But <laughs> I could give it a go. <laughs> uh, what made me want to be a writer? Oh, I... When I was a little girl, I used to read every book I could get my hands on. It had to be fiction, mind you. We'd go to the library and my brothers would go straight to non-fiction. I'd go straight to fiction and I would read every book I could find. Um, I loved all the fairy tales and then I loved all the Enid Blytons and then I loved all the uh, the romances and oh, particularly, you know, Jane Austen and the Bronte sisters and so on. And by the time I got to 45, I, I had just read thousands and thousands and thousands of books. I used to be found hiding somewhere in the house with a torch <laughs> trying to finish a book because my sister would tell me to turn the light off, Linda. <laughs> it would have been midnight, mind you. <laughs> so, yes, I always wanted to be a writer. I just didn't think it was possible. Um, I do have a bit of a bit of an amazing story about that, actually, if you'd like to hear, seeing as I'm here, I will tell you how I became a writer. I went to my sister-in-law's uh, book launch, Benison O'Reilly, who's a wonderful writer, and I remember standing there thinking, oh, I'd love to do this. But you know, at that point I'd, I had two young children and I'd just finished my degree and um, I was working in marketing, teaching, lecturing, all these other things, nothing to do with writing. I suppose marketing is. And then um, I said to her, I'd love to write a book, and she said, you should. <laughs> And anyway, we sat up and talked about it that night. She was very patient considering it was her book launch. But anyway, sorry, Benison. And then the next day, I'd actually had a break between jobs because my company closed down. And I sat down in front of a computer and this idea that had been just spinning in my head for so long and I about writing about Nana and Da and I wrote Gallipoli Street. And then I just stared at it. And then I remember this story about Nana growing up on a dairy farm um, and at a friend's dairy farm and her galloping along the cart down dirt roads with her blonde hair flying behind her long curly blonde hair and just so happy, one of her happiest memories. And so the opening scene of Gallipoli Street was written that day and I wrote, you know, he, something like he could hear her voice carrying across the fields, you know, and the, and the rattle of the cartwheels. And I was so excited about it and, um, I wrote that book in about three months because I wasn't working, so I just did it seven days a week. And first draft probably was terrible, but I, I was really excited about it. And um, so I got everyone I knew to read it. And then I got advised very strongly, <laughs> must have been Benison, to rewrite it. And um, I think it was Pol Polish it, I think she kindly said. So I rewrote it and then got very excited all over again. And I went to every publisher in Australia every single one and um every single one of them rejected me <laughs> three years of that what a crazy woman I often think there must be so many great novels out there but people aren't stubborn enough but I'm very stubborn so I wouldn't give up I remember my brother James saying to me oh look you've got some lovely rejection letters <laughs> 
why don't you just frame that really nice one and put it on the wall and say, well, you know, I got close. But I said, no, I will never give up. I'll never give up. I actually had Nana and Dad's photo in front of me. I'll show you the photo. I'm sitting here. That's, um, that's their photo. Isn't that gorgeous? Handsome and beautiful, aren't they? I like to think. Anyway, I used to put a candle um, in front of that photo every day and I would light the candle and I'd beg them to get it published. I'd just beg them, please, please let me get published. And I used to imagine being published and imagine getting the email and, you know, it was just everything I wanted it so badly. And um, in the middle of all of that, my very beloved father died and it was just a heartbreak. And anyway, I kept trying because I kept thinking he would so want this and I knew he'd really want it. And then um, it was his anniversary of dying and we all went out to lunch and we're talking about what would you ask him to do if he had any powers from the other side? And I said, all I want is my book to be published. <laughs> it's all I want in the whole world. It's all I've ever wanted is to be a writer. And the next day I got up and I realised, because I'd gone to bed, that at the exact moment that he died a year before, I got an email from the publisher and saying yes. <laughs> it was the most incredible thing. And um, and then, unbelievably, another publisher came back two days later and I ended up with two publishers wanting the book. So I'd gone to every publisher in Australia rejecting me <laughs> to two publishers wanting the book. So it was just amazing. And so everything just took off and now we're sitting here. This is book number seven, seven books in seven years. And I've got two more manuscripts, one nearly finished and, and one in development, almost finished. And uh, I haven't stopped writing ever since. Isn't it funny that you can just get one little bit of encouragement, one one incredible stroke of great fortune, and it can change everything. And um, in actual fact, that's what happens in the new novel, bringing it back, that it's just twists of fate. It's twists of fate. But you think everything comes down to that big break and that success and that's what's going to make you happy. But you do learn somewhere along the line that what really makes you happy is the joy in the everyday experience of it, that I get to spend so much time with my family because I'm home. I've always come home from school, um, Jimmy's finished now, and I could... I could make them afternoon tea and I'm here, you know, and I'd say something funny and it would turn up in the novel I was writing or, you know, I could never have written about love without the husband I have. He's, he's the love of my life. We've been together since I was 18. So there's all these things that you realise, all these lovely things that happen around you, these everyday things are actually the really amazing events in your life and that's what I think draws me to write family stories because it's so important to have those everyday wonderful little miracles you know when your son gets out of the car and casually throws over his shoulder love your mum <laughs> they're the, they're the things or, or they might just spend the whole night you know having a game of who can who can bounce a ball into the basket on the other side of the house and all that silly things you know I think that it's important that we we keep those because back in those days back in Iris's day that they didn't have computer games and televisions it was a long time until they had a wireless and so they made their own fun and and they're really funny people you know and they and um, my uncle played guitar and grandfather played the fiddle and I look at it and I think I really grew up appreciating that you can make your own fun and the best memories are the ones you're all going to share together when no one's no one's plugged in and um, you're really just present. And so writing this book in lockdown really helped me with that because I was really living that. I was living the four of us every day. Should have been Groundhog Day, but I was just very, very lucky to share it with my boys and husband. Yeah. <laughs> so a few questions. Um, are all my books standalone? Yes, Chris, they are. Though if anybody has read Sisters of Freedom and Gallipoli Street, 
will see that there are um, the very end of the book is a lead in. It's funny, and most people have, haven't caught on to it. I thought it was so obvious. It was this hint. That, uh, anyway, now you've got to go look for it. <laughs> um, what else? Is the next novel based on family as well? Oh, an actual fact, Debbie, the next novel, I've got two going at the moment. One is not historical. So that's the really big gamble. Um, and it's not contracted yet, so I don't know if it'll ever be. I <laughs> hope so. But it's actually about my um, my formative years in my 20s, um, going down to Manly all the time and the whole Manly surf scene. And um, I really love Manly and it's sort of my spiritual home, so it's all about that. It's a bit sort of like the big chill and they all come back together 20 years later. It's one of those. Uh, the other one I'm writing is about an Australian soldier in Crete who falls in love with a resistance fighter called Athena um, during the Nazi occupation, and and he's German-Australian, and his father's incarcerated in Australia purely for being German. He's a good man. He's a professor. So I just thought what an interesting juxtaposition. But, of course, you know, there's, there's so much family in there. Whenever I write about Australian soldiers, I always end up sounding like my brothers and my husband's brothers, you know. I know Aussie Larrikin very well. <laughs> um so they were so resilient. They certainly were. I loved your mention of a wireless. <laughs> what would they have done without the wireless? Thank God they had that. Because uh, this is the generation that had Farlap and Bradman and um, the, the very first sort of um, radio shows. Uh, I talk all about that in the book because it's really interesting, I think. And uh, they thought that was so modern to have these things. And they, were, they could go to the films and see a movie. And You know what's really lovely? is how much glamour came out of the fashion of the time. And, of course, that's a massive theme in the book. And I had so many wonderful hours just trawling through pictures of um, Joan Crawford and, and Betty Davis. And it, oh, Joan Crawford, have a look at the dresses she wore. She had this incredible designer. I should know his name. But she she was so elegant and she could just, the way she would stand, you know, every photograph is this art. So that was fun. That was really fun. And I love to think that they had something beautiful to look at, you know, even if it's just through a shop window or looking at the magazine they couldn't afford to buy or sitting in the movie theatre watching these women walk around and, and these men dancing on air. And um, it was a very romantic time and I think that Hollywood was rising because it delivered that, people needed some escapism because it was hard too. Yes. Um, reading Iris at the moment and loving it. Thank you. Um, I know I still love the radio too, Diane. Um, when we go along on the radio, I think we're getting old because we'll put on, you know, ABC Talkback. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, what happened to the Hooter Gurus? What, when did I get like this? I used to love Midnight Oil. Come on. Mind you, we still listen to that too. <laughs> Um, what else have we got here? Thanks for writing the beautiful stories and bring history alive. That's an interesting point, Kim. Someone said the other day, well, in actual fact, I read an article the other day, um, that fiction cannot possibly teach anyone anything about history. I, I so disagree. I, I think that a lot of the historians that wrote and recorded history had their viewpoint on it in any way. There's probably a lot of fiction in it anyway, you know, the to the victor go the spoils. So I think if you can make fiction alive, because I don't really read nonfiction, so I, I, I will watch documentaries and things and do a lot of research, but I want to read a story. So I think that um, historical fiction has a very strong role to play in helping people to learn how it felt to live then. Not what happened, even though that's part of it, but how it felt because we're emotional creatures, humans, and I, I think that's really really what its place is and it's an important place. That's what I think. But I write historical fiction. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to wrap it up pretty soon. Is there any final questions before I go? Um, oh, someone, someone's agreeing with me. Thank you, Nola. We learn a lot from historical fiction. <laughs> Um, my hubby used to say that until I got him to read a few I've enjoyed from the war years, he's on board now. <laughs> yes, it, it's really funny. And I, um, you see Tracy saying quite a few people are agreeing with that. Isn't that an interesting topic? That could be a good one over a dinner party. Do you think you can learn history from fiction? 
go for it. Tell me what they say. <laughs> anyway, I'm probably going to, oh, thank you, Bill. Bill agrees with me. Look, I've got all these people agreeing. Where were you the other day when I was on that, that chat? <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much for everyone coming along. It means so much and this book means so much and to finally have it out there and people reading it, it's been a year and a half or something. There's so much work that goes in and my editors and publisher, I'm so grateful to them and we all worked really hard and and we're so thrilled. And I have to tell you that my cousin Daphne, who's Iris's daughter, when she finally did read the acknowledgements at the end and saw the photo of her mum, she did cry. And I said to my husband, my, my work here is done. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy it and you feel it too. And thank you so much for coming tonight.